Okay, so uh, just to get started, uh, uh, some ad administrative items. Uh, the uh, the official lectures are now from 9 to 12 on Thursday. Uh, we have the blessing of the powers that be. So that's um, that's been set. Um, the um, The notes, um, the, I, the, the PDF of the notes are found on the course um, kind of directory set up here, class notes. So like you've got from the first, actually the second lecture, uh, the notes you can download and likewise the videos um, from the essentially the first <clears throat> lecture on Thursday last week. Um, otherwise, on its learning, there's been a first exercise, um, um, homework problem one, which has been posted um, here. You can just um, download that. <clears throat> I thought I'd look at it uh, briefly with you. Um, Let's see here. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's handed out today. You're supposed to turn it in as a single Excel file on its learning uh, in a week. Um, the, the file naming that we'd appreciate you using <clears throat> is la your last name, uh, dash problem one, dash solution. Excel, it might be XLS, X, I think, or whatever, XLS, M, depending how, but it's basically an Excel file. <clears throat> you don't have to do it with Excel. I mean, if you want to do it by hand with a table and the old style from the 1970s, that's fine, <laughs> but probably you won't. But if you do it by hand and want to turn it in that way, then you'll need to do a scan of what you've turned in, of what you've actually solved by hand, okay? So um, it does have to be turned in electronically. So the problem is basically what we discussed towards the end of Thursday last week, is to consider this um, original uh, reservoir accumulation with some constant composition spatially, vertically, aerially, and so forth, um, through time, geologic time, um, faulting, um, the left or west side or whatever it is, the left side of the structure is split from the center side, from the center part and the, and the right side. So basically you get three different reservoirs um, as of today. And then uh, the one is deeper uh, and shallower. <clears throat> In general, the pressure and temperature will be increasing with depth, which is the assumption here. And we're interested in, in um, how one can define this as a reservoir gas, uh, this is a reservoir oil, and this is a two-phase reservoir gas plus oil. Hopefully, from the lectures today and perhaps early Thursday, um, you'll you'll start seeing how to solve that problem. Um, anyway, so that's um, uh, basically the problem, and you're supposed to explain that in terms of using a so-called pressure temperature diagram, is what we're going to talk about today. And the pressure temperature diagram is just designed for a given composition. Every mixture uh, will have its own pressure temperature diagram. And on the inside of that diagram is where you have two phases, gas and oil. And on the outside of that diagram is where it's single phase. So that's just a map of where it's two phase and where it's one phase. And uh, since the composition is, is the same in all three reservoirs, um, and it, we're going to choose from this figure 212 in the, in the book. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the book, by the way, has been, has been posted, I think, um, here, the electronic version. Um, so you now have access to the book, even though the physical book hasn't come into the, uh, into the, uh, library yet, or not the library, but the, uh, 
bookstore. Um, so you've got this pressure temperature diagram, and I think I give you the, the pressure and temperature in the middle section, and you're supposed to find the pressure temperature in the high and the low uh, fault blocks. That's what these are called, fault blocks. These are reservoir volumes that are separated there by fault, and they're usually originally the same formation. And you're supposed to come up with uh, pressure and temperature and explain why why this is considered a reservoir gas, this is considered a reservoir oil, and that is considered both. Um, and then the second part of the, of the problem is just to do conversions from, from mass, uh, mass fractions. This is from a, a problem in the book, or it's a chapter six. You don't have to read chapter six, we're just using this information, <coughs> converting the, the mass amounts that are actually measured by the laboratory converting those to mol molar amounts. And then um, that's to be done for two cases. One case is where you know the molecular weights and you assume the molecular weight of this heavy stuff, heptanes and heavier, is, is as the laboratory reports. And then you have to go fetch the molecular weights for the other compounds. And then um, convert from masses to moles. That's a fairly simple exercise. And then you're gonna do repeat of the same exercise, but uh, with the understanding that that number there, 218, is probably at best 5, maybe 10 percent accurate. So we're going to say, well, what if it was 10 percent lower, okay? And we're going to have you go through the conversion from the mass fractions to mole fractions using this um, lighter um, description of the, of the heavy stuff. So that's uh, basically this problem one. Um, any questions? Uh, probably need to look at it first and then maybe on Thursday you can ask questions if you have any. <coughs> I think chapter two um, may be the very early section of chapter three uh, with regard to mass mold conversions um, should be sufficient. Um, you should read in a sense chapters two and three but I mean you only need to read the parts that um, I'm talking about. So there's a lot of stuff in chapter three I don't talk about. So you um, you can always ask me, well, section three six on this or that, should I read it? And I'll look at it and say probably probably not necessary. But the best guide is what I talk about in class uh, in terms of what's uh, required uh, for you to study. So that's the problem that you'll uh, be able to download. Okay, so um, last uh, Thursday we ended by talking about um, the uh, pressure temperature diagram. And we were talking about it for a single compound. And the purpose of this pressure temperature diagram is to give a map of the pressure temperature space where you'll find a one phase, we might be calling it an oil or a liquid uh, or a gas uh, vapor, um, and uh, the PT space where are two phases where both um, two phases oil and gas coexist okay So that's kind of the, um, the uh, purpose of the pressure temperature diagram. And then we had, for a pure compound like uh, water, I think we were talking about, um, on a linear scale, I exactly how it looks, I, it's, it's going to be a lot of curvature down here because it's very close to zero 
he goes, well, it's, it's going to be something like this, but um, goes up something like that. And then I'm going to put a point here. And this is the end of the vapor, this is the vapor pressure curve. Temperature, uh, so-called critical temperature, and the critical pressure. That's the end of the, what we call the vapor pressure curve. Or the boiling point curve, as you like. Okay, at a given pressure, it's the temperature where it boils. That's what we're more used to. We could also call it, a, I suppose, a boiling point uh, curve. Okay, and we talked about for the for the water case, if we went down here to atmospheric uh, pressure, then for water, at least, um, this temperature here on the curve represents the normal boiling point. So this is always called the normal boiling point. Normal meaning normal pressure. So it's the boiling point temperature at one atmosphere. The normal boiling point. And for water, that, <clears throat> that temperature is 100 degrees C at one atmosphere. <clears throat> okay? Uh, standard, Condition. standard condition, yeah. Standard condition. Usually around one atmosphere. Um, okay. And it is along this line where you have two phases or you can have two phases of a pure compound, okay? That's, that's the only place. So along that line, uh, we basically have the two phase, and everywhere so outside that line, it's single phase, okay? So along the vapor pressure line, we can have or we do have two phases, okay? But the amount of the second phase, as we talked about, could be so small that you would never really see it, okay? That first bubble, you just, you don't quite, it's there, it's this bubble so small you can't see it, okay? You have two phases. And then basically everywhere else, <clears throat> It's single phase. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to sketch over here on the right. Um, uh, the plot of pressure versus volume. And I might occasionally write little v, which is just defined as the volume in cubic meters divided by the moles of material that we're talking about. So if I'm talking about one liter of water out of the faucet, we can calculate the number of moles, and it would just be the kind of the relative, they call it the molar volume. It's the volume per mole of substance. And <clears throat> now I'm going to have to do something here to help me on this diagram. So. I'm going to have to give myself a little more room that.
Okay, and let's see here. Just to give myself a little more pressure. Um, and I'd, I'd like to have a little more <coughs> volume. <coughs> so, <coughs> the, um, the pressure volume relationship of a pure compound is very special at the critical temperature. Okay, so at that condition, there's a very special relationship of pressure and volume for be it mercury or methane or water, doesn't matter, okay? And, and what's special about it is that um, somewhere in here, this is the critical pressure, right? Let's just say we're right here. So this is at the critical pressure. Um, the, the pressure at this temperature, if we go to very high pressure, the volume's going to kind of approach a, a limiting volume. If we take any substance and we bring its pressure to one million bar, the volume will stop changing, essentially. Okay, you, you can compress it from a million to 10 million bar and, and the volume doesn't change very much because it's essentially becoming incompressible. Okay, or very, very slightly compressible. Okay, you're making it more and more. And, and so it's gonna be coming down from this asymptotic volume here. And in terms of, of the little v, we call that value b. Okay, it's just, it's the limiting minimum volume you can take any substance and pressurize it into. That's the volume per mole. Okay, so it's gonna be coming down from that asymptotically, kind of. And then it's gonna come in here and as it approaches this pressure, the critical pressure, it's actually gonna become completely flat. Okay, and then It'll continue its descent down something like this, and then off here into the very low pressure range and the very large volume range, it starts behaving like an ideal gas. You know, as the pressure goes real low, the molecules are far away from each other and the volume gets monstrous. And so we're approaching kind of, it's, it's if I had more room out to the right, I would draw it, but it's kind of approaching, um, ideal gas behavior out there at some point. Clearly gaseous behavior. Okay, and right here, the derivative of pressure with respect to volume is zero. For all these substances, you know, any, any compound is gonna be like that. And in addition to that, because it's monotonic, it doesn't go down and then come up again, then the second derivative should be what? I think if, if, the, if the second derivative is positive, is it like this or is it like that? It's, it's, it's either a minimum or a maximum, I don't have to remember, okay? And if it's negative, it's the other. But if it's monotonically changing, then back there in your math course, and I, I can't even remember ever learning it, the second derivative of pressure with respect to volume is also zero because it doesn't turn around, okay? So that's for every substance. <clears throat> so let's, let's instead take our substance being water, okay, at 100 degrees C, Okay, and we've got our liter of water in our container. It's, we boil it to 100 degrees C, and before that first bubble of steam comes out, we start compressing the volume. Okay, we start compressing it. So we bring it from one, atmos one atmosphere to, to 10 atmospheres, to 100 atmospheres, 
to 1,000 atmospheres to 10 million atmospheres. And what's going to happen? Well, down here at one atmosphere, I'm going to say that the volume is here. That's at one atmosphere. So whatever, it's one liter per however many moles of H2O that is. Okay, I don't know what the molar volume of, of, this, of this boiling water is, but it's something. We can just say, think of it as in terms of one liter. If we put it in volume in liters, that would be about one liter. Okay? One liter of boiling water. But if we take it, keep it at 100 degrees C, and we take it to very high pressures, then I'm going to try and do my best here. This this is going to go. As asymptotically go up towards B. Because it doesn't matter what the temperature is. If you put enough pressure on it, that volume is going to go to the same value, B. Okay? So B is independent of temperature. So it's going to go up like that. So that's if we pressurize it, or if we re reduce the volume. What if we take our one liter boiling water, and we make our kettle, our boiling kettle, two liters? What's going to happen? Any suggestions? I've got, I've got one liter of boiling water, and all of a sudden I have some magical way I can, like, make the, the container of that one liter of boiling water, I can make the container two liters. Okay? What's going to happen? In terms of pressure? Huh? In terms of pressure? Or? Yeah, in terms of pressure. Decrease. Okay, decrease. Decrease. I'm doubling the volume. Keeping it at 100 degrees C. Does anybody agree, disagree with the, decre the pressure decreasing? <coughs> now, I asked you guys to go home and do nothing on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, but think about the problem of a butane or a propane tank, right? I asked you to, to not eat, to not sleep, to think about what goes on in a propane tank or a butane lighter. Okay. Well, we'll still take talk about water, and then that'll help you think about the propane problem or the butane problem later. What will happen if we double our liter size to two liters, just magically, keeping it 100 degrees C? What will happen is that this strange, very strange thing will happen, is that the pressure will remain exactly one atmosphere. One atmosphere. If I, if I increase it to 10 liters, 10 times the 1 liter, the pressure will remain at 1 atmosphere. Okay? I can increase it 100 liters. The container's now 100 liters. We had 1 liter of liquid, okay? But it's being filled with that same amount of water. But the pressure doesn't go down. The pressure remains constant, one atmosphere. So this thing here is going to go like this. We're increasing the volume, but Mother Nature will not change the pressure at all. And in fact, only when we get out to here to approximately a thousand liters, a thousand milk cartons, Something will happen, and the pressure, and the pressure will actually start dropping. Okay. Yeah. But according to PV equals nRT. PV equals nRT is ideal gas. It's saying that it is a gas. When I start with my one liter of water at 100 degrees C in one atmosphere, that is very far removed from being a gas. There's some other law describing it.
So you keep expanding and expanding and expanding, and the pressure just doesn't change. And that's kind of weird, okay? Finally, you reach this condition of about 1,000 times the volume, and the pressure starts dropping. What has happened? What has happened when we reach that volume? Okay, I'm going to start down here. I've got this container, you know, one liter, okay? Here. And now I've got this, you know, huge thing. Thousand liters. Well, if we go kind of halfway in between here somewhere to some big volume, okay, maybe it's 50 liters or something, what will it look like if we could look inside it? Well, so what it would look like is that you'd have some liquid here, some liquid, be careful with this one liter, I'll, I'll use the, the SI symbol for liter, it's a script L, okay, this is 50 liters. The liquid here, the liquid here will be maybe 0.4 liters or something, I don't know, probably more than that, I, it'll, it'll be something. You can probably figure it out, but it's the liquid in these containers, the liquid water, will be getting smaller. But the part that is no longer liquid becomes steam. And steam, one, one gram mole of steam occupies about a thousand times one gram mole of liquid. Okay? So for every molecule of H2O that jumps into the steam phase, it's, it's, in, it's creating a much bigger volume, okay? Okay. So what's going to happen is that we're, we're changing the amount of liquid water from 100% liquid water to basically 0% liquid water. The last drop of liquid goes into steam, and from then on, the ideal gas law takes over, and the pressure drops, according to the ideal gas law. But until that last drop of that last molecule of liquid water, liquid H2O, jumps into the vapor phase, the steam phase, that pressure is kept constant, and Mother Nature does it. Don't ask me how. Okay? Busy lady, Mother Nature making sure that the pressure stays constant when, you know, three molecules of H2O jump into the steam phase and, the, you know, the volume gets a little bit bigger. It, it's, a, it's a weird thing, but it, that's what happens. Now, if we went to a different temperature, this was 100 degrees C for water. If we went to a different temperature, like up here, then all of this would be going on at a higher pressure, right? And it would probably have the liquid, I'm sorry, try to make that at the same pressure. So that's where basically this would come down here, and then it would reach that point. And if we expanded the volume at 300 degrees C, whatever it is, expanded the volume, some of it would become high pressure steam. This would move over like that until it got to maybe 50 times the volume. And then the last drop of that pressurized steam uh, or liquid would become steam, everything's steam now, and then it would start following some kind of gas law. Okay? So here it's behaving with 100% liquid, here it's 0% liquid, and it just depends where you are in temperature, okay?
And if you join these these points here, this is where we have this is what we call saturated liquid, which is boiling water in the case of HCO. It's saturated. What is it saturated with? Steam. Okay. Boiling liquid saturated with steam. And we call this saturated liquid. And these, where it's all steam, that's saturated steam. What is it saturated with? The boiling water. Okay? So this is... So this is saturated vapor. Okay? And inside that envelope of pressure and volume, we have what we call the two-phase region. Okay? The two-phase region. So it's an envelope. In terms of pressure volume, it's an envelope. Outside here, everywhere outside that dashed line, it's single phase. Out here, it's single phase. Out here, it's single phase. Okay? Everywhere outside that dashed line, it's single phase. Everywhere inside it, it's two phase. Okay? In terms of the pressure temperature diagram, the two phase region is a line. Okay? It's a line. It's along that line. Okay, if we look at the pressure temperature diagram along the line only, we have two phases. Only on that line. If you're on that line, you, you can either have and see two phases, okay? But if you can't see two phases, you're on that line, what do you have to do to see two phases? Change the volume. Either increase it or decrease it. One or the two. Okay? If you're out here on the gas side, you've got a thousand liters of steam, okay, and it's one atmosphere, 100 degrees C, and I say, well, Curtis said that it should be two phases. I don't see any, I don't see any second phase. You just make it a little bit smaller volume. Mother Nature will keep it at one atmosphere, and you'll see some liquid droplets appearing, okay? Keep getting it smaller and smaller and smaller, you'll see more and more liquid appearing. And then you go all the way down to one liter, and you'll, again, see just one phase. But it's still saturated because if you increase the volume just epsilon, that bubble will come out. Okay? So along the line, it's two-phase. Along and inside the dashed line over here, it's two-phase. Yes. How sensitive is the line? The line is infinitesimal. <laughs> At one temperature, it's only one pressure. I mean, I don't know. I, it's 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 the line. It's it's there's no thickness to the line. All right. So now it seems confusing. It's but but you understand water. I mean, you understand steam. I mean, you, you, if, if you did an experiment at home and you had this balloon that you put on the end of your tea kettle, okay, you had one liter of water in your tea kettle, and you had a balloon that had no, it didn't take any pressure to stretch it, <laughs> okay? You could just kind of stretch, stretch the, you could just make the balloon, okay? Then what you could do, what you would do is that you'd find that that as you, as you made the balloon bigger, you made the balloon three liters, okay? 
you'd know that some of that one liter of boiling water would be filling the balloon, okay, with steam. You know it's steam in there, right? You pop the balloon, you get steam in your face. It's not nice. Fuck. Okay? That's what's going on. Now, the case of the propane tank for grilling. The, pace, the, 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 um, the case of a propane tank is, is basically, I don't want to mess up the, the picture here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make propane, I don't know, what do you want to call it, red or orange, okay? The propane th tank thing is, does anybody know how many liters there is in a propane tank? It must be 100 or 50 or something, I don't know, something like that. It's, it's, it's something like, now this is not the, the this is not the phase diagram of, of propane, but it would look like this, just different values. Let me just sketch down here kind of propane. I think this is about three bar. I think the, the propane tank comes with some pressure, three bar or something like that. Maybe five bar, I don't I really know. Okay. And let's say that um, this is volume. We just use regular volume in liters. And let's say that the propane tank is is um, ten liters. I don't know what it is. Thirty liters, something. It's something. Okay. Okay. So when you get the propane tank, I think we talked about it last time. You get something that's basically looking like this. You got vapor, you got liquid, you got maybe about three bars, absolute, and maybe you've got 10 liters, something like that. The 10 liters is not going to change, <laughs> okay? Unless you got a problem, it blows up or something. 10 liters is fixed. Here. But if we put this in terms of, of uh, molar volume, which is liters per mole, okay? I don't know what the moles is for how many moles there would be, but let's, let's just pick a number. Let's just say it's, it's uh, one mole makes 10 liters, okay? One kind of mole, my mole. So I'm gonna say that this is one liter per, per mole, some kind of mole, I don't know what it is. Okay, so now we're actually okay, operating on this basis here. What happens when you empty the propane tank? The volume remains the same, right? What happens? The pressure doesn't drop, but we'll come back to that. Well, if we look at just the x-axis, the volume is going to be fixed, but the molar volume here is going to change, right? Because you're going to take out moles to burn to make your chicken, right? You have to take out moles. So what's going to happen is that the number of moles is going to be a function of time as you are using it. 
right? And the number of moles is getting smaller, right? So what's going to happen to this molar volume? It's going to be moving to the right. Okay? It's going to be moving to the right. But because we have two phases, we know that that is on the propane pressure temperature diagram. It's, it's a point on the diagram. Three bars at 25, nice sunny day in Trondheim, 25 degrees C. <clears throat> Three bars, something like that. So what's going to happen is that we're going to move from where we start here, we're going to move to the right as time goes by and we use the propane tank. Okay. We're changing the molar volume from where we start to the right, but for a pure compound that's saturated with two phases, Mother Nature won't let the pressure drop if it's water or propane or whatever it is. So the pressure is going to be maintained constant in that propane tank. So the propane tank is going to deliver gas to the grill at a constant pressure, which is beautiful. You don't need a pressure regulator. Mother Nature automatically feeds at that pressure because of this phenomenon, this phase behavior. So it'll keep the pressure three bar continuously until what happens? Okay. If we look at the if we look at the cylinder right here, we look at the same 10 liter cylinder. What do we have? Now we've got this much liquid. Oops. Right? We got vapor and we got a little bit of liquid. That's why if you weigh the, the propane tank, <laughs> okay, it's going to weigh less. Okay. And when we get to this point out here on the right where the last propane liquid droplet vaporizes into the gas phase, then this thing is going to go down like that, following the ideal gas law, more or less. And in fact, it, it'll go very quickly. <laughs> the pressure will, will drop very quickly, and you'll basically, you're in the middle of the chicken, you're in trouble, because you've got no more heat to finish off the chicken. Okay. So Mother Nature's delivering, you're changing the molar volume, but Mother Nature won't allow you to change the pressure until you get rid of one of the phases. When you get rid of the one of the phases, in this case the liquid, then the pressure starts dropping. Butane lighters, the same thing. When it, when it won't light anymore, you basically don't have any liquid left in it. There's still some butane inside there, but you, you hit it and it just, it's vapor, it's all vapor, it just, it's empty. Yeah. What would control the, the length of that status, like the, the length of the line when it converts from 100 liquid to zero? It's this. You can see, I mean, you can see on this figure here, at, at, at low pressure for water, there's a, ver there's a, a, a ratio of 1,000. Okay? For propane, it's not 1,000. It's, it's something else. It's, it's different. It depends on the compound, depends on the pressure and temperature. So is that why when you do it in the critical temperature, it's like one point only? And yeah, when you get, point? yeah, this, the, the critical is a little bit special because what happens is that your saturated, your saturated uh, liquid here, right there, and your saturated vapor, just to the right over here, they're getting closer and closer in, in, in properties. And as you reach this point here, in theory, there's two phases. You can have 99% one and 1% of the other, but the phases are identical. So it's kind of hard to label them, okay? It's kind of blind person would come in here and wouldn't be able to tell who's who, right? So at the critical point, everybody's the same. 
So the two phases are identical at the critical point. How many have heard about the vapor pressure curve in your earlier studies? Boiling water, steam, everything, okay. okay. And what's a little bit of a shame is that, you know, this really is the essence of, you know, vapor pressure curve and, I mean, this is kind of, and, and it's pretty strange and it's pretty cool, it's non-intuitive, it has some very practical consequences industrially the whole grilling industry, you know, unless you use charcoal, <laughs> you know, the whole gas grilling industry, uh, lighters. Somebody's making a lot of money off of the fact that Mother Nature does this because you reduce the cost of the equipment not needing a back pressure valve. Okay? Mother Nature is your back pressure valve. Okay. So this is. Um, this is the single component. So now we'll take the break, and then after the break, we'll talk about two components, and then we'll go jump to 200 components, okay? One to two to 200. <laughs>